Welcome to Facebook Live with the Kansas City Star Editorial Board. I'm Colleen McCain Nelson, Editorial Page Editor, and I'm here today with Derek Donovan from the Editorial Board, and our guest is David Frum, Senior Editor of The Atlantic and also the author of Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic. Thanks so much for joining us. What a pleasure. Welcome to Kansas City. Thank you. Um, so you're here to do an American Public Square event this evening, and you'll be talking about your book some then. Uh, you argue in your book that Trump is doing perhaps permanent damage to the democracy. What concerns you most at this moment? Well, at this very moment, the two, I, I would say I'm concerned most about two things. Um, the first is the politicization of uh, the Department of Justice and the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, one of the things that Trump has forced us to realize is that a lot of the rules that are written down on paper are not the rules by which the United States government actually operates. For example, theoretically, the president can fire the head of the FBI for any reason. Uh, theoretically, the head of the, uh, the president said, I don't want a woman in this job, and fire the head of the FBI director for that. In reality, the president can only fire that what has been the rule since the death of J. Edgar Hoover has been that the, you are, can only be removed from being head of the FBI for a reason, and a good reason. Um, Donald Trump is asserting a new power to fire the head of the FBI for any reason. And he's now fired two, both James Comey, who was the formally and com approved by Congress head of the FBI, and then Comey's successor, Andrew McCabe, who was never confirmed as director of the FBI, but was acting director. And both of them have been removed for running investigations of the president and his friends in ways that the president doesn't like. Um, the president is now asserting an absolute right to do that. If that, if that, if he gains, if he prevails on that, um, we are going to have a very different kind of country from what we had in the days, which were, were the rule until before Donald Trump, where the president could remove the head of the FBI for a good reason and after consulting with Congress. That was how it was done in 1993, the last time an FBI director was removed. I think a lot of people just kind of intuitively think there are lots of checks and balances in the government and on the president and that you can't get too far afield and he's kind of testing that question on on some things and we're finding out that if you're not inclined to be shamed into doing the right thing or not inclined to apologize that you can do a lot of things that perhaps we didn't realize right. are, are there more checks and balances that are needed or or <laughs> what what is the remedy there well, this is an example of how the, the rules on paper and the reals, rules in reality depart. Uh, the way the American political system has operated for most of the time is it's not really a system of checks and balances. It's a system of check and balance. That is, it's the president versus Congress. Um, the courts are there to police the most extreme infractions. Um, the federal bureaucracy has some role in the distance, but it's really a game, the, the separation of powers and the supervision of Congress over the president. And it's always been assumed, and it was the case until quite recently, that members of Congress cared more about Congress than they cared about anything else. So, you know, when Jimmy Carter was president of the United States, there was a Democratic Congress for four years. When Bill Clinton was president, there was a Democratic majority Congress for two years. And in both cases, those Democratic members of Congress that were members of Congress, and if the president does something that we don't like, we're going to assert the prerogatives of Congress. But since the middle 1990s, we've gone through a period of extreme partisanship in the United States. I'm not the first to say that. And the political scientists who measure it say, we've not seen anything like this since the 20 years after the Civil War, or really since the 10 years after Reconstruction, when Democrats returned to Congress, where we've got like a kind of frozen civil conflict. And what you discover is that the Republican members of Congress act like Republicans, not like members of Congress. And so even when the president invades their most you would think, cherish prerogatives, they let him get away with it. Even when he commits near crimes or outright crimes right in front of them, they don't do anything about it because their, their loyalty to party trumps their concern for their institution. And that's quite a new thing. How big a role do you think that the, at this point, extremely well-established conservative alternative media plays in that? You've written about that quite a bit. They play a huge role because they um, pervert the incentives available to members of Congress. Um, if we live, if this all of this were happening in 20 years in the past, uh, Devin Nunes, look at the incentives that would be available to a Devin Nunes, who's the uh, head of the House Intelligence Committee and one of the worst actors in the story, and who's used his job to attack the very institutions he's supposed to oversee, um, to defame individual people, and to act as basically the president's defense attorney within what was supposed to be a highly prestigious committee. Now, tw 25 years ago, um, 
in doing, uh, in behaving as he did, he would just forfeit the, the respect of everyone relevant to him. Um, he would forfeit the respect of uh, the newspapers who covered what he was doing. Uh, he would forfeit the estate, respect of local elites back in California to whom he would look for re-election. He would forfeit the est uh, esteem of um, people in the intelligence world because you might be thinking, you know, uh, Porter Goss, who had that job in the 2000s, went on to head the CIA. Um, maybe if you do a good job, you can be an important figure in you know, the executive branch, national security role. Um, he would care about all of those things. He now lives in an environment in which he cares about one thing and one thing only. Does Fox tell his most ardent supporters and donors that he's standing up for Trump? And so he lives in a, in a universe with, like one set of, with one set of priorities and that have nothing to do with the good of the system or the good of the country. And how do you account for the fact that that whole ecosystem has flipped from being pretty strongly anti-Trump just two and a half years ago to now being so, I, I think, almost, not 100%, but close to universally behind him? Uh, that's a very important point. That's one of the major themes of the Trumpocracy book, which is that Trump really, the key moment in Trump's rise was not just that he humiliated and defeated the Republican establishment, but he humiliated and defeated Fox and forced into retirement Megyn Kelly, the network's biggest star, and made over the whole um, Fox primetime lineup. So it's now you know one hail to the fearless leader after another from 7 until 11, and that was different. Um, what Fox discovered was the same thing as the Republican Party discovered. We had, and I grew up in this world, we had a set of ideological commitments that we thought conservatives cared about. Um, and it turns out they didn't care about any of those things. A small number of talkers cared about them. That's not what the rank and file cared about. Trump, who has some great gifts, one of his was just, he find, found those deep things that the conservative base in America most cared about. And he spoke to those. And what he also realized is they that that base loved conflict as an end in itself. They don't actually want to accomplish anything. There's not some law they want to pass. They didn't even like the tax cut that much. What they love, they, with the, the conservative base is made up of people who feel the country's going radically in the wrong direction. They're very pessimistic. They don't even think they can win this fight. They just want a lot of yelling on the way. They don't want to go down soft. They want to go down fighting. And Donald Trump said, I'm going to shake my fist at all the people you hate. Um, and uh, Fox learned this about its own viewers. I talk in, in the book about how Fox in 2012 was thinking about turning over a new leaf and trying to become a somewhat more responsible news organization than they'd been in the past. And they tried it and it failed. And they decided, you know what? The, the problem with us was we weren't brutal and vicious enough. Uh, when I talk to some Republicans who are uneasy about Trump, often I get kind of this, well, this too shall pass, um, thought from them that this is temporary, eventually we'll elect someone else <coughs> and, and this will just be a distant memory. You've made the argument that this may not be temporary, that there could be long-lasting impacts from Trump. Well, I would say first, the sunny American confidence that everything will turn out all right is the greatest obstacle to turning out everything, everything turning out all right. When I hear Republicans talk of that, I'm, I'm reminded, I traveled a lot in Eastern Europe just after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And there was a joke that they told on themselves. This is not a demeaning joke. It's their own joke. Um, and the joke was how many Czechs, Poles, Romanians, Bulgarians fill in nationality, liberated nationality, does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is none. The market will do it. <laughs> and, and, and you need to understand, the market is just people. So you say, it's going to be all right. Yeah, possibly. If you Step up. And when I say you, I mean you, the person I'm talking to right now. If you step up, then maybe things will be all right. But if you say someone else is going to do it, that someone else, that, I'm going to look to someone who's even more cowardly than I am to do it, then it's really not going to happen. And the damage is real. I mean, if, if, if Trump wins this fight against the FBI, which he could, we are going to live in a country in which the National Police Service is answerable wholly to the present of the moment for any reason at any whim. And the President Trump is claiming the right to start investigations and to stop them in his narrowest political interest. No president has ever said that before. If Trump gets away with it, every president who follows will, want, will be tempted by that power. Right. And you, me you mentioned Republicans who just essentially aren't willing to criticize Trump. And it, it does feel like you don't have a lot of company as a Republican who's come out there against so many, Trump. There's so many who are willing to tr criticize Trump. Are you kidding? I mean, when they, publicly. Publicly. <laughs> publicly. Well, well, one, of, one of the things, and this is a real um, bugaboo of mine, it's become sort of a, a political mantra, um, that 
one of the things that is, you know Washington well, one of the things you discover in Washington is uh, the things that people say, in the, people want credit for the things they say on the green room, in the green room. And then they go on TV and, then, and, and say something they know to be untrue. And then they return to the green room and they say, you understand that's my job. But the, here in the green room, when I'm, when I'm reacting like a normal person, um, that's the real me. I always say, no, that was the real you. The person who went on camera and did that public thing and from, as a human being in a public role, that's you. Everything else is just chatter. Um, you know, we all intend to give more to charity. We all intend uh, to um, read more to the kids. But if we don't do it, then we haven't done it. And the, you don't get credit for that intention. You know, I really should give more to charity. Uh, in the same way, you don't get credit for in the green room telling the friendly journalists, you know, it, it embarrasses me when Donald Trump bullies a woman the way he does. And then you go on TV and say, I don't know what she's talking about. Uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, you wrote a pretty influential essay in The Atlantic about the rise of authoritarianism and what might happen yes. under Trump. Looking back at that today, in May of 2018, what part of that was prescient? And where do you think the biggest creeping authoritarianism uh, yeah. risk is? Well, I, um, I, I will stand up for that. I think it was, it was very prescient. And the, the most useful thing, it seemed to me, in that article was at the time there was a lot of loose talk um, about the overthrow of the United like, States. People would compare Trump to Hitler. They would compare what happened to Mussolini. And the point of my article is to say you have to reckon with the fact that the United States is a, is a big bureaucratic, legalistic federal state. And things that could happen in other places and other times, they actually can't happen here. What you need to focus on are the things that can. So tr obviously a president can't cancel elections. Most of the elections are administered by the states. How, do, how does a president give an order that the state of Missouri don't have an election? Um, if, you, if you're worried about that, you're looking in the wrong direction. Um, nor can the president um, sim have the National Park Service round up dissidents. I mean, that, that can't happen. My, the, the point of that article is to say, let's talk about the things that actually could, within the context of um, the, the laws and practices of the U.S. government as they exist. Um, so what the president can't do is use armed police people, arm, um, uniformed police people, uh, to bully and to arrest dissidents. That, that couldn't happen. But what he could do, and we see this, we've seen this happen a lot, is use his social media presence to rev up people who are not police, ordinary citizens, to inspire them to acts of violence and intimidation that are just as good from the point of view of fright, frightening people. Um, you know, it, uh, early on there was an incident where Donald Trump took credit for saving a, a bunch of unionized jobs at a factory in Indiana. Uh, the local, the head of the local union local, um, sp spoke truth and said, "This is all a fake." Um, as indeed it was a fake. The jobs have all vanished. Uh, Donald Trump named him in a presidential tweet and said something vicious about him. And the man had to leave his home because of death threats, not from the cops, just from people on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and that, that a lot of the intimidation that happens in Trump America, and especially against journalists, is done by volunteers who aren't paid by the state. As you all know. Um, I'm sure you get a lot of pushback from Republicans um, for criticizing Trump. I'm sure folks say, well, clearly you're not a Republican. You say you're still a Republican. I'm, I'm interested in your thinking on that. And, and if you don't like the president and you don't like so much of what the party is doing, why be a part of this yeah. party? I, I was on uh, the Bill Maher show with Anthony Scaramucci, and he threw that <laughs> accusation at me. And I, 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 I pointed out that I served in a Republican administration about 40 times longer than he did. <laughs> uh, and um, Not an exaggeration. <laughs> no, that's literally true. <laughs> uh, um, I'm a registered Republican in the District of Columbia, for whatever that, that means, um, and I've spent my life in this world. But um, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm not a Republican the way um, people are Republicans now. Um, 25 years ago, if I asked you a series of questions like, uh, do you go to church on Sunday? Do you hunt? Um, are you married? Uh, I would not, those would not...
Um, uh, however, this person is not acceptable. So that way of thinking about politics, which would have made perfect sense to a Democrat who didn't vote for George McGovern in 1972, or a Republican who didn't vote for Barry Goldwater in 1964, is really unprocessable today because our, the parties have become centers of meaning in people's lives in a way that they never have been before. Um, I see my job, look, we need a, we, 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 so long as there's an electoral college, this is gonna be a two-party system. And it does no good at all to have one party in a two-party system committed to democratic outcomes. You need both of them. Um, so I need to stay where I am, where I've always been, um, where I share important values. I mean, I'm very hawkish on foreign policy. Um, I really do think governments should spend less and provide less in services. Um, I uh, generally think markets work best when left alone. Uh, um, but I, so I, so I, I, that's my church. Um, now, I don't share every view that that church has um, developed over the last 10 years, which has become so extreme. Um, I think you can believe all of those things and also believe, you know, it would be better if um, there was some guarantee that everybody would have access to health insurance. Um, it would be better for markets. People would be more willing to, to quit jobs and to move and to, uh, for new opportunities if they didn't have to worry that, okay, well, I'm healthy, I can get insurance, but I've got a disabled child and I'm on a good plan. That means I have to stay in place for the rest of my working career. How is that helpful to a free market economy? So what should Republicans do on health care? Well, that's going to take this into a long discussion. <laughs> uh, um, uh, my, my view, um, I've shed blood, I, I have been arguing this point for a decade, I got sacked from a conservative think tank in 2010 for saying this, is that they needed to understand that the stars had lined up differently in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act than back in 1994. The Democrats were going to pass the ACA. They also remembered what happened in 1994 when they didn't. It was going to pass. So the right thing to do was to negotiate in advance for a Republican-looking version of the ACA, which shouldn't be hard because the basic grammar of the ACA was drawn from the Heritage Institute and um, the Romney plan in Massachusetts. I mean, it had been tinkered with. There were a lot of things Republicans didn't like. And indeed, some of the things that Republicans didn't like had been deliberately put there by the Obama people to have something to trade away. Oh, you don't like this? Okay, we can take it out. But we need... so. Um, I would say what the Republicans should have done in 2010, what they should have done in 2017, and what it's decreasingly possible, but still they should do, is they should accept the basic architecture of the Affordable Care Act, and then they should try to make it more market-friendly and less redistributive. By, for example, um, uh, it, we, um, within the states, uh, you want to encourage, um, you want to give the insurance companies more leeway to experiment, you want to have real markets within the in, um, states, and you want, instead of driving people out of the exchanges, which breaks the exchange and makes healthcare unavailable to individual people in an economy where more and more of us are self-employed and working in gig economy, um, actually want to, over time, encourage employers to put their people into the exchanges. Because uh, what conservatives used to all agree was that getting insurance through your employer was the single biggest thing wrong with the American healthcare system. Made costs invisible, it bound people to employers, it created a kind of serfdom. Uh, you want them, those individual marketplaces to grow, not shrink. Um, I would give states a lot more leeway to fool around um, with Medicaid um, than they have now. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to make take Medicaid up to 140, 150% of poverty. Uh, that was a good thing. Uh, but then the states really have to be able to run it the way uh, they want to. And then the whole thing needs a proper financing mechanism. Um, Obamacare purported to finance itself with a tax on very high income people. That raised nothing like the kind of money. That was just a provocation. The way it's really financed is by internal, invisible internal subsidies within the system that fall heavily on younger and healthier people and then make healthcare an ever worse purchase for them. So I think it needs to be explicitly subsidized from taxes and with a non, with a flat, with something that everybody pays. Get rid of the t surtaxes on high income people because that's just a scam. And say, all right, we're going to provide subsidies to a, a lot of people are going to need subsidies. Medicaid has to be paid for and, it, and everyone's going to have to chip in. And that's going to mean something like maybe a national VIT, uh, value added tax, maybe a carbon tax. Uh, but we're not going to have the fantasy that, that the Koch brothers are going to pay for health care for everybody in America. That's not going to happen. It's crazy. It's a false promise. It should never have been made. 
It's interesting to hear you talk about a VAT um, and some of the other funding mechanisms there might be there because you also nodded to the gig economy, which is, of course, largely a cash economy, right? right? And so for a markets kind of guy, how do you see those people who are working in that quasi-legal realm of that gig economy fitting into that healthcare system? All right. Well, now we're into deep into the weeds of policy, my favorite That's subject. Right. This way. Um, first, the gig economy is not as cashless as, as you might think. I mean, it, they, people may use Venmo, but they, uh, they don't use actual folding money. And, I mean, I have... I mean, one, to my horror, I have like uh, three children, two of them in their twenties, and one. they never carry money at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's like offering them a typewriter. Like, you know, <laughs> here's, you know, uh, here's twenty dollars. What? No, they use Venmo. Um, so the transactions are becoming actually ever more trackable, and um, I mean, there will always be. There's a lot of because of the high number of illegal immigrants in the United States. There's a lot of gray area. Um, activity and a lot there is a cash economy in some areas. I mean, I think house cleaning is very much part of the cash economy. But uh, I would think you want to, yeah, pull people into um, the clear and taxed economy. Um, immigration enforcement would be crucial to that. You need to have to make sure that your workforce is a legal workforce, um, and uh, and then the superior convenience and safety of Venmo. I mean, one of the things that people at the low end of the economy have to worry about a lot is being robbed. Uh, that that you know the most I think the most targeted group of people in the economy used to be cab drivers because they carried lots of cash and they were vulnerable. Um, if, if if you were a cab driver, you'd want to live in a world of no cash at all, and it, all Venmo transactions. So let's uh, and then they're taxable. I have to say the VAT is not my favorite tax. I, I would prefer to see um, a carbon tax, but something that created a revenue stream for health insurance that was paid for by everybody. Not on a f capitation basis, but uh, on a f something flatter that recognized everybody benefits from health insurance, everybody should pay something. It's not all going to be paid for by the Koch brothers. You've also suggested that Republicans have veered in the wrong direction on guns. Yeah. Uh, what should they? What should be their platform on on gun control? Well, you know, this is an example of how things have been radicalized. We are at the point now where if you say. I don't know that somebody with no ID and a record of beating his girlfriend up to the level of an outright felony should be able to carry an AR-15 into a daycare center. I don't know about that. Oh, well, you're defying the sacred principles of the Second Amendment. Um, I, I, I just think that like, the demands have become so crazy that, that the Second Amendment, I mean, it is literally true. You're supposed to be able to, that, that, that there are states where you can take guns into daycare centers. You can take them into bars. Um, you know, people want to be able to t have, take their guns all the way to the um, beep beep machine at the airport. Um, and, 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 when I, and when I say guns, Welcome I don't mean... Welcome to Kansas and Missouri. <laughs> okay, I, they're not talking about... But I, I spend much of my time in a very rural part of Candle. About half my neighbors uh, have what we, When my late father-in-law was alive, we had a shotgun. And you use it, you know, we got a coyote problem, we got, a, we got you know, animal predators of all kinds, and people in lonely farmhouses, you know, worry about security. So there's, uh, you know, the demand, farmers should be able to have a shotgun under his bed at night. Or, uh, you know, hunting gets people, uh, you know, off the couch and into the outdoors. It's a wonderful activity, part of our North American heritage and should be encouraged. And by the way, in a 10-day hunting season, you'll probably get off six shots <laughs> if, if you're doing, if you know your business, um, the, the permission to do that um, it, uh, is a different thing from you know AR-15s in daycare centers. Uh, again, let me just cite the Canadian example. There are a lot, as I said, there are a lot of guns in Canada. Um, there are even quite a few handguns in Canada, although they're hard, they're, those are harder to come by. But the, the reason Canada doesn't have the rampage of gun violence is if you want to get a handgun, and you can't get an AR-15, but if you want a handgun. What you do, you have to fill out a form, and in the form, you have to produce affirmative evidence of mental stability. You need a letter from a mental health practitioner, and uh, you, the police will usually ask for a letter from your intimate partner. And then they will interview your intimate partner without you present. Interesting. And say, you know, are you comfortable with this person having a weapon? Um, and a lot, a lot, a lot maybe because the, the, the single number one, at the risk of provoking all, the single most frequent use of firearms in North America, the thing that they mostly exist to do, is to intimidate women. Um, and that the number of occasions a year where that, that's the number one use. Um, so it would be good to ask a man who wants a gun, because it's a man, 
ask the woman in his life, how do you feel about it? And if she's uncomfortable, you shouldn't, probably shouldn't have one. That's not ever going to fly no, here. But, but it, I, I think we just have to move from a world in which um, it's an as of, unless you can affirmatively pr uh, prove that the person has committed domestic violence to the level that rises to felony status, that unless you have that, you get a, you get a weapon, no questions asked, and any weapon, I think you need to move to a world in which you say um, rural people need them, and uh, ur urban people um, should show why they need them. So you have written quite a bit about relativism, and a lot of people are trying to sort of make a little bit of a, of a comparison these days between 70s, 80s style philosophical relativism, which, yeah. it, you know, those of us who study philosophy, you know it's a little bit of a word game yeah. in a lot of ways. It's, it's pretty theoretical versus the way that a lot of people are wielding fake news and things yeah. of alternative facts as political weapons today. How's that different? How are, how are the two related or not? Well, I don't know that there's a direct family relationship. Um, but... Uh, I'm not going to forget which awards ceremony it was where Oprah told everyone that you have to honor your truth. Right. Um, and this became a great, you know, viral video. But a, a world in which we say you have a truth and you have a truth and I have a truth is a world in which it's very hard for you to say to me, but you're lying. I said, no, no, I'm not lying. That's, that's just my, my truth. truth. Um, and, and this all, where the origins of this, and most of us are repeating ideas that we don't know we didn't invent. We don't know where they come from. We didn't know who invented them, but they're really not our, our own ideas. Um, we inhabit a universe in which we're influenced by thinkers who taught that the idea of truth was oppressive. Uh, the idea of a truth allowed some people, powerful people, to impose on others their vision of how life should be lived, and what we needed to do was to uh, emancipate truth and allow everyone to seek their own. And the assumption was that what would follow was a world of many truths. What was followed instead is a world of a lot of lying. Because at least in politics, the opposite of truth is not true. The opposite of truth is lying. Uh, but you'll find among the enablers of Donald Trump, there are many people who have absorbed this idea that if you strongly believe something, that makes it true. And yet, all of us strongly believe things that are not true. Um, ask the average American, are you a better driver than average? <laughs> and something like 80% will say yes. Okay, so that's a belief they have. I'm sure they're, and I, if you ever talk to one a person who's driving you don't like, you'll discover they're quite strongly convinced of their own driving skill. But they're wrong. It's just a fact. They're not better than average. Probably worse. <laughs> um, we're just about out of time, but I'd, I'd like to end with what I hope is a glimmer of hope. I'm. I, you, I'm very hopeful, <laughs> by the way. And so, I, yeah, I'm going to blame you for the questions now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Uh, but you, you remain committed to the Republican Party. You, you're a conservative. I'm interested in conservatives who give you hope or conservatives you think could move the Republican Party in the right direction. Okay. I'm going to use an analogy here. It's a little disgusting. But you'll forgive me. This is very homeless. We have a, daughter, we have a teenage daughter. So we have three children. We have a teenager still at home. And she's had a little bit of skin issues. So we've gotten her a medicine called Accutane. And the way Accutane works, for those of you who know, is it, it clears acne for life, but the way it works is it starts at the base of the skin. She really appreciates you offering <laughs> this up, by the way. Well, I, don't, I don't think she's going to watch this. And, and what it does is it pushes up through the skin, and it pushes all of the pus through the skin and out of the body. Okay, I think we're going to go through something like that. We just have to have this, like, pus push out of the American system. I take back what I said about ending on a glimmer of hope. Um, but, uh, okay, here's the hope. What I, I am amazed by as I've been promoting this book, here's, I began talking about these issues in public on a long scale, a large scale, after that article came out in the spring of 2017. And my book came out in, in January of 2018, and now we're uh, in the later part of the spring of 2018. When I started talking about this, everywhere I went, the dominant mood of my audiences was fear. And what I've noticed, the past two or three months, the fear's gone. Fear's gone. People are puzzled. They're angry. They're beginning to be resolute, but they're not afraid. And what they are, um, Abraham Lincoln said, at a worse crisis than this, I, I always believed, he said, there was just enough virtue in the republic to save the country even if it sometimes it was only just enough for you. I haven't quoted him exactly, but that was the idea. Well, that's what was, that people are saying, you know what, we need resolution. And maybe not enough, and maybe not fast enough, and maybe not always strategically enough, 
Um, but I'm seeing it, and I'm seeing it in that change, that uh, mood from, from, from fear to resolve. Um, and uh, I think we're, gonna, we're moving to a world where um, Republicans are going to take a lot of casualties in um, November, something I would normally regret, but I think um, is absolutely necessary. Um, I, I, the, be, the bigger, the, uh, the better. Um, the president will suddenly find himself, for the first time, encountering something like a check, maybe only a, a partial one, but something like a check. Um, and I think that the, the truth that he has hidden under his lattice work of lies, the truth is coming into view as well. Um, and we, uh, there are many more crises that are going to come to the fore, and in particular, I think when the Mueller report emerges, I, I imagine we are like that of a very intense crisis because I think many of the worst things that Mueller discovers, I hypothesize, will not be illegal. And the illegal things he discovers will not be the worst. Um, so we want, we're going to have a battle where people will, de defenders of the president will try to point out to this or that um, atrocious act, but it didn't violate any statute. Or anyway, it violated only a very technical foreign agent registration statute. Um, there's no major criminal law against what the president did. And so that'll be a big fight. But I, I, my sense of the temperature is um, Donald Trump's greatest resource, resources have been apathy, um, hopelessness, and tribal division. And while our tribal divisions are not going away, um, the apathy and the hopelessness are. And even the tribal divisions are being rebalanced enough that the tribe that has enabled the bad things is going to be just that much smaller, that it will not be able to protect Trump all the way to the end. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll, we'll continue the conversation this evening uh, at the American Public Square event. For folks who want information about that, they can find that at AmericanPublicSquare.org. We'll be live streaming that as well. So folks can tune in on our Facebook page. And thanks for tuning in to Facebook Live with the Kansas City Star Editorial Board.